What I'd like to talk about is um, uh, a geoengineering technique called marine cloud brightening. And of course, geoengineering has a somewhat dubious reputation. A lot of people are very skeptical that we should actually do any of it, except for the fact we have been doing it for the last, I don't know how many, 100 years um, as humanity has developed, but particularly since the Industrial Revolution um, in using fossil fuels, of course. Um, so what I will talk about is, firstly, uh, just very quickly, why we have to move to this at this point. And as you may be aware, 2023 saw some pretty dramatic changes uh, in climate change. We've, I would argue, moved into a new era. It's the first year where we have actually hit 1.5 degrees C warming relative to pre-industrial. Uh, the second half of 2023 was actually 1.67 degrees C, and September broke the record by about half a degree C. Now, one year is not a trend, of course, but the evidence seems to be that the Earth energy imbalance is such that we are probably going to see another hot year in 2024, and it is quite likely that that trend does actually continue. We've seen uh, dramatically changed impacts in terms of heat, storms and floods. The graph there shows uh, things that have taken scientists completely by surprise in terms of global sea surface temperatures. The orange line there is what happened in 2023 relative to uh, decades beforehand. And 2024 is the black line at the top left-hand corner which is not looking good, to put it mildly. We've seen other major changes I won't go into, such as the Antarctic and so on. And one of the big concerns now is that the so-called climate tipping points, where you move from a relatively um, gradual change in climate to a non-linear, potentially exponential change from one steady state to another, may have been passed in a number of the key areas. I won't dwell on climate change now, uh, tipping points now, but I'm happy to talk about it in the um, in the um, discussion. The upshot of that in uh, the view of myself and my colleagues is that humanity is now in very big trouble because we now facing the reality that the danger of irreversible runaway climate change is multiplying fast. This means that we've got to see carbon emissions, and not just emissions, but atmospheric carbon concentrations reduce extremely rapidly. And we have achieved precisely nothing in that regard, unfortunately, after 40 years of discussion. If you look at the fundamentals, our leaders have failed in that very fundamental issue of understanding what climate risk really means. This is one of the latest pictures um, of what is going to happen if you take current government commitments uh, and industry commitments. We are likely to see emissions in the same position by 2050 as they are today, when we should see them dropping dramatically. So we haven't woken up. We are basically on a path toward three to four degrees C, and much above three degrees C is pretty unsustainable or survivable in many parts of the world, including significant parts of this country, Australia. So we have a very major problem that people have just not woken up to. And of course, we're uh, compounding the problem by initiating conflicts all around the world at this point, which is not helping because that is adding immeasurably to carbon emissions and preventing us getting on with the job of reducing them. So we have to take emergency precaution, precautionary action. In our view, uh, this is a, a schematic representation. That is the current path, the black line. The dotted line is the danger level for cascading tipping point impacts and the so-called hot earth, the hot as earth phenomenon where we may get uh, irreversible warming taking place. We have to get off that path, which means we've got to get emissions down as fast as possible. 
we have to also draw down carbon from the atmosphere, which is rarely talked about in all of these discussions we have at COPs and what have you. So we have to have a drawdown, something like that. But this is not going to be good enough because we are already going to exceed 1.5 degrees. We're probably already there pretty much. And we'll be extremely lucky to avoid um, not going over 2 degrees C, which means we have to then pull down temperature after that has occurred. Um, overshoot, if you like, and, and pulling down afterwards. To achieve that, we have to have some form of active cooling, which is going to cool parts of the planet to buy ourselves time whilst these other changes are taking place. The sort of things that Ted and Anita have talked about in being implemented extremely quickly, if we can do it. So that is the objective of this active cooling process, is to give us time to achieve these further effects. So if you look at the sorts of things we're talking about here, I've just listed here on the left the potential drawdown arenas. I won't go through all of these in great detail, given the shortage of time. And on the right-hand side, the cooling effects uh, you could look at. And uh, marine cloud brightening is what I wanted to talk about today, as this is one of the potentially less damaging or less risky approaches to uh, geoengineering to achieve, achieve that active cooling. There are various um, what one might term solar climate intervention methods, intervention methods, sorry. Um, item one here is self uh, surface albedo enhancement, in other words, increasing the amount of reflective ice or whatever, if we could do it. Um, the second one is increasing the reflectivity of marine clouds, which is marine cloud brightening. The third might be uh, putting atmospheric uh, stratospheric aerosols into the atmosphere uh, to reflect radiation. The fourth might be putting some sort of space-based mirrors and so on in place, which obviously has major engineering issues. And uh, the fifth is sort of decreasing the amount of high altitude cirrus clouds. This is just some of the things that people have talked about. But I'll concentrate just here on the marine cloud brightening aspect of it. The principle is, is fairly straightforward. Essentially, if you have high clouds, um, they essentially trap more heat. If you can create lower clouds, they reflect more sunlight. And clouds get whiter, essentially, it's been discovered by adding nanoparticles, uh, essentially, from sea spray. So the technique is essentially to work on that. Now, it was noticed, uh, I think, in back in the 70s, that um, cloud condensation nuclear were formed from ships' uh, ex chimney exhaust, created smaller cloud droplets and resulted in whiter clouds from shipping, uh, traveling around the world at that point in time. It was proposed then in the 1990s by John Latham that if you use sea salt nanoparticles uh, to form that nuclei to reduce marine cloud droplets, you would then end up with having whiter clouds. And that's a fairly simple process that um, you see there. So if you look at marine cloud brightening in a nutshell, what it's doing is, is creating a sea spray of um, sea salt nanoparticles at the marine boundary layer um, below existing clouds, about one zero to about 1.5 kilometers. Those nanoparticles are uplifted into the clouds by natural turbulence. The nanoparticles act as a natural um, a nuclear form formation, and uh, they reduce the cloud droplet size. So the smaller droplets, if you can create them, are essentially whiter, and whiter clouds reflect more sunlight, which gives you essentially greater albedo and hence the cooling effect uh, through the atmosphere. So the process of, of doing this is firstly, 
uh, from a laboratory point of view to generate the right sort of aerosols um, in a nano sort of aerosol generation process to then try out single plume studies um, from ships and so on in a marine environment and then lead into multiple plume studies uh, to prove up the process. The history of this so far is that this has been largely, uh, in, well, entirely laboratory and desktop studies, apart from work that has been done in Australia, where we have the Great Barrier Reef, which um, you may know has been uh, subject to uh, considerable problems because of very high sea surface temperatures in recent time, where we have major bleaching events, and there are now dangers that um, coral reefs generally, certainly in the tropical zones, are under threat of extinction because of the uh, temperature, sea temperature increase we're already seeing. So uh, groups at Southern Cross University here have been trialling this technique in practice on a limited scale. They, it was first tried in 2021. The general indications are that it might perform better than the models predict. Uh, <laughs> and um, it was demonstrated you could actually get the nanoparticles from the sea spray into the cloud formations. <clears throat> so why is it that we consider that um, marine cloud brightening is the best option? Well, I've just put up three options here, uh, geoengineering options that have been um, talked about. It's a space shield approach, stratospheric aerosol injection, and marine cloud brightening. I won't go through all of this, but the marine cloud brightening essentially allows small trials to be carried out already. You are sort of mimic mim mimicking the natural sea spray events. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, it's mild cloud engineering. It has the advantage that you can switch it on and off if it's discovered there are problems with this. You can turn it off and the effects disappear very quickly. You can do it in a localized sense, but it has uh, impacts globally. It can be developed very quickly. And as you can see from the comments I made earlier, we have a very limited time in which to make some of these things work. So it has the attraction that it could be available within five years. In fact, we really do need to see it far sooner than that if we could possibly do it. And because of its, um, I suppose, more natural approach than the other types of techniques, <laughs> the societal acceptance of this is likely to be far greater. So those are the, uh, the, the sort of advantage of the whole process. And um, we're now, we have an initiative called the Blue Cooling Initiative, which is aiming essentially at uh, trying to get this up and running as a matter of urgency. <laughs> so the critical message in all of this and the actions we need to take is that we have got to get to zero emissions at emergency speed. The whole idea of net zero to, uh, by 2050, which is what um, the world is largely working to in official sense, frankly, is complete nonsense. We have to achieve this far more rapidly. The earth is already too hot, as we've seen, so we have to have large scale drawdown. The damage is going to continue to become far worse before long-term solutions are effective. So we have to have a safe means of immediate cooling. So this process of produce, remove, reflect, <coughs> and repair um, is the framing that uh, I think we're using. The Blue Cooling Initiative itself, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can see it on the website, um, is set up to try and do all this within sound governance principles. And we're currently in the process of trying to find funding to initiate uh, the, the principle. There are a number of universities involved uh, in Europe, in Australia, and in the US. 
Thank you very much indeed.